Alright, hello everybody, Resonance here, and today I'll be giving you all my commentary on Game 2 in a best of 9 series played between the two teams, Tyrant Warlords and Poison of Zone. This match was of course part of the round robin stages of the War is Coming tournament that is currently being hosted on Voobly, and you can find more information on it as well as links to download the replays on AOC Zone in the video description below. I will also have links to watch the other Wars Coming matches and or other expert games with my commentary in the video description as well. For the most part, I will be casting individual matches rather than the entire series, because I don't have the time to do a quality analysis of so many games. That being said, today's game between Tyrant Warlords and Poison of Zone is one that I am very excited to show you. While Tyrant Warlords is full of nothing but talented players, Poison of Zone has also consistently shown their ability to compete with the best teams that Age of Empires 2 has to offer. POZ scored 6th place in the SY Nations Cup, and they always make it to the final stages of team game tournaments. I expect a very high quality game from these two teams as they both battle it out for a spot in the Grand Finals. And speaking of the Grand Finals, by the time you watch this video, the War is Coming Grand Finals will probably be finished. But I still plan to cast a few games from that series soon, so preferably don't spoil the results for me if you can. And as always, I love reading your comments, so feel free to let me know if you enjoyed this video, and if you would like me to cover some of the Grand Finals as well. Alright, without further ado, let's jump straight into Game 2, which will be a 4v4 on the map Land Nomad. Now, while the players choose a location to settle, I am going to take a brief moment to explain what Land Nomad is. Like with the standard Nomad map, each player spawns without a town center or scout, and instead their villagers are spread out across the map. Both teams will have to coordinate locations to settle and make sure that nobody is isolated or surrounded by the enemy team. With only limited knowledge of where resources might be, players must carefully find a balance between exploring for the ideal location to settle or immediately building a lumber camp so that they do not fall too far behind. The two main differences between Land Nomad and Regular Nomad is that on Land Nomad there is no water, and players must build a lumber camp before they can have enough wood to build a town center. And now that I've explained the basic premise of Land Nomad, it's time for me to introduce the players to you guys. So on the left hand side of the map we have the team Tyrant Warlords. Near the far left corner we have Slam playing as the Purple Persians. Just a bit above him we have Riot playing as the Teal Chinese. Near the top corner we have Bact playing as the Orange Mayans. And to his right we have Fire playing as the Blue Mongols. On the right side of the map, we have the team Poison of Zone. In the far right corner of the map, we have Tsunami playing as the Green Mongols. And just a bit below him, we have Rats playing as the Grey Mayans. Near the bottom corner of the map, we have Kyo playing as the Red Persians. And to his left, we have Tammy playing as the Yellow Chinese. Now, the first thing I want to focus on is actually how important it is to be as efficient as possible in the early game. From even the tiniest differences in execution, there can be a significant difference in how the match plays out. Let's take a look at how Fire and Tsunami are starting the game. Both players built their lumber camps at exactly the same time, but one of them is going to come out ahead here, and why? Not because the surrounding areas have substantially different available resources, but actually because Fire manages to start gaining an early game lead because of something as simple as the location of his lumber camp, and the way that he assigns his villagers to the trees. So basically, when the villagers walk to the lumber camp to drop off their 10 wood once they finish chopping it from the tree, they barely have to walk at all at Fire's lumber camp. When you consider how many trips a villager must take to drop off its resources, this adds up incredibly quickly. Not only that, Fire did not have to reassign his villagers to those trees after building the camp, but rather, he sent them to those trees immediately. Compared to Tsunami, who unfortunately had to reassign his Lumberjacks, which we can see by all the chopped trees right there, it's going to put him quite a bit behind, because this is not nearly as efficient. The Basically, when your villager is reassigned to a new tree, it has to take a few seconds to chop down the new tree first before it can start harvesting lumber. And something as unbelievably small as that can be enough to snowball a game at the top level. At 2 minutes and 50 seconds in, Tsunami actually has a 40 wood deficit compared to Fire. Fire has 40 wood, a 40 wood advantage over Tsunami. This tiny difference in execution will actually allow Fire to start building his town center nearly 20 seconds before Tsunami gets to start building his. 
And since they're both the same civilization, whoever gets their scout rush rolling first can be at a huge lead. That's not to say that Tsunami doesn't stand a chance here, but every little bit counts. POZ certainly still has the potential to win this game, but they will likely have to defend Tsunami if he falls behind in the early game because of this. It's really, really fascinating how something as small as the way you assign your villagers at the start can really, really add up. You can see right now that the town centers gonna come up definitely at different times, and Fire here also gonna do something that's very efficient. As his town center is super duper close to finishing, he's gonna start chopping a little bit of wood too. Why is he doing this? Because he needs to get just enough wood to build a house, because he's gonna be at... Well, you can go check that out right about now. Check it out, he's at 3 out of 5 population, so he needs to get enough wood to go build a house, which he's gonna be able to do right now. So little, little things like that. He's just one step ahead of Tsunami in the early game, and that's why Tyrant Warlords and Tyrant Legends are, you know, considered to be such a powerful, powerful team, because they've got every single aspect of AoE2 nailed, basically. Uh, you know, even something as tiny as the way they assign their villagers. Look at this. The house, already up from fire. The house, just starting to be built from Tsunami. Pretty big difference. And while everyone is building up their empires from humble beginnings, I want to talk a little bit about their civilization choices as well. For starters, the Chinese is a wonderful pick for a map such as Land Nomad because the Chinese start with six villagers instead of three. You can <laughs> you can understand how that would be a very, very substantial advantage. For one, you get to start chopping wood uh, a lot sooner, you get to build a lumber camp faster, get the wood needed for a TC faster, build the TC quicker. Oh, it, it really does help a lot. And that's also why both teams happen to have, well, such great civs like the Mayans as well, because the Mayans have four villagers instead of three. Really, every civ that they picked here was exceptional for Land Nomad. Mongols great too because Land Nomad is full of all these delicious huntable guys like the Javelinas. And of course we got the Persians in which their town centers work a bit faster. This means that they create villagers faster, research techs faster, advance faster. Oh it's just wonderful. We got the early boar lure coming in here from fire. Makes sense he's the Mongols and he'll be able to harvest from that real quick. The Mongols hunting bonus is incredibly incredibly useful in these games because you already harvest from a wild boar quicker than you do from a sheep and with the Mongols bonus, you really do get a snowball things, and when we look at the way that the, the game is set up here, this is a Mongols mirror. These are the two flanks of the team. So we got we got Fire as one of the flanks, four Tyrant Warlords, uh, Slam is the other flank, and Slam's going to be fighting Tammy down here in a Chinese versus Persians matchup. And at the top, we have the flank of Fire versus, well, uh, POZ's other flank, Tsunami, and this is a Mongols mirror match, like I said, so they're both probably going to be going for around the same thing. Uh, usually you expect to see some sort of scout rush, especially since these players are in relatively close proximity. I expect to see a scout rush from them. Uh, and, well, since they're both going to be doing basically the same thing, that means that the player that is slightly more efficient and ahead in the early game is going to probably be the one who comes out, and we just saw that Fire does have a pretty solid lead. Looks like he's exploring a little bit and he noticed that there's a critical thing going on with the map here. We take a look at POZ's map. Well, I mean, everyone's map is, is looking pretty solid, although Tsunami is in a slightly unfortunate uh, predicament because almost all of his gold is at the front of his base, and that is no good. <laughs> Looks like Fire is coming in here to go lame a bunch of deer, and, you know, this is another thing that does make a very, very big difference in this mirror. All these deer, they're now dead, and they're going to start decaying food into the void, and Tsunami will not be able to claim any of that deer at all. And now he has to pull these two villagers off of his sheep and try and stop fire from laming all these deer. <laughs> now Tsunami is forced to build a mill right here and start harvesting from these deer as fast as he can because they're decaying rapidly and well that's most of his hunt. Uh, really like, <laughs> fire has access to all these deer which he can go harvest from one at a time and not waste any food but now Tsunami is in big trouble because he's got this boar that's decaying, he's got this sheep that's decaying, food is disappearing around him, and now Fire gets to walk away satisfied that he has now completely shut down Tsunami in the early game. This might put him ahead as far as maybe 30 seconds when it comes to advancing, and well, we'll see pretty soon how substantial that can be. In terms of the rest of the map, well, things look pretty easy to wall if your name isn't Tsunami or Fire. Really, the rest of this map is pretty easy to defend, uh, you know, especially for Slam. Uh, you just close this area off with some Palisades or Houses, you can close this off as well. The map is already shaped in a way that conveniently creates a good, solid, just team wall off that they can all share. Rhea can just close this area off, close this area off, perfect, perfect. This area can be walled off as well, and we can see, you know, that Tyrant is already considering this, and they're already prepping it with the way their houses are positioned. You know, they're already 
forming the beginning of a makeshift wall off man the situation is relatively the same for poz although this area is a little bit wider uh, tammy will be able to close this off quite easily this area again closed off by keo so expect to see a team wall off here uh keo's already working on this side and he'll be able to connect it uh to rats and that will keep them very very safe rats here looks like he's actually walling himself off from the rest of the team walling himself off from tsunami and to me, what this signifies is that if he's walling himself off from the team, it's either a miscommunication or he's going to go for a sling of some sort. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna lean a lot more towards the he's definitely slinging here, as these are very, very top level teams. I'm sure they are communicating where their walls should be positioned, uh, you know, over Skype or some other voice chat, because he's he's got the double layer coming up here. So, if you're wondering what a sling is, and it's a pretty common strategy in team games when you got this many players here. A sling is basically when you get to the feudal age, and what do you do? You build a market and you start heavily tributing your teammates. Now, the War is Coming tournament is actually played on a specific balance patch in which uh, slinging is a little bit nerfed because it is very prevalent in a lot of high-level AOC team games. Nerfed in that, what they did is they made it so you cannot research the coinage and banking technologies which reduce the fee that you pay when you tribute your teammates your own resources. They reduce that fee. Now the thing is, is though, is you can't get those uh, techs until one age uh, later than you normally would be able to uh, when you're playing on the War is Coming patch, so coinage, which is normally available in the Feudal Age, will not be available to the Castle Age banking, only in the Imperial Age, and this does reduce the uh, prevalence of slinging quite a bit, but we've still seen a good number of slinging going on in the tournament anyway, and perhaps that is what Rats is going for. He's the Mayans, so his resources do last 20% longer as part of his Civ bonus, and that means that, well... He's going to be able to get a strong eco and sling that out, and, well, some of the first players to the Feudal Age are going to be the members of Tyrant, Reed, and Fire, and if we take a look at Tsunami, well, his deer got lamed. He's not quite up to the Feudal Age yet. In fact, by the time he hits the Feudal Age, the stable should already be done from Fire. Yeah, the stable is done, and now Tsunami's in the Feudal Age. Forward Spearman coming out here from Fire, and this is something that I like a lot. Like I mentioned, we can expect to see the mirrored scout rush from both these Mongols. Very, very common strategy. Since Mongols hunt faster, they are much better at stockpiling food than most civilizations. So going for a unit like scouts, uh, which cost nothing but food, is very, very good for the Mongols because they'll be able to afford them easier, get them out quickly. The Mongols also get to advance super duper quick because their hunting bonus. They can stockpile the necessary 500 food to go from dark to feudal age before anyone else and get the scouts out sooner and scouts are better sooner than later because once you get out some spearmen the scouts get to do not too much and you can't make spears in the dark gauge looks like fire is in to tsunami's base and tsunami is not ready for this these two forward spearmen are absolutely brilliant from fire i cannot stress enough how smart this is preemptively predicting the obvious scout rush and he's got these two forward spearmen which the Spearman will be able to deal with Tsunami's own Spearman, and will also stop Tsunami from being able to use his own scouts efficiently. Now Tsunami has to make his own spears, and this is just looking fantastic for Tyrant right now. Looks like Riot was going for a scout rush of his own, which is interesting considering he is the pocket, but this is how Tyrant has coordinated this, and those scouts coming out, but Keo is all walled up. Looks like POZ is turtling like nobody's business here, and they're going to be closing off just about everything and now Riot has to go find a location to raid and who better to raid than Tsunami who is just a teeny bit behind uh, Fire who is just playing out of his mind. He's on fire this game. <laughs> so anyway, Spearman coming out here from Tsunami which is pretty good. He's going to get uh, some free damage onto Fire's Spearman as Fire is going to go send in a bunch of his scouts and he's going to be joined by Riot. Now the thing is here is that on Land Nomad it's a bit different than regular you know 4v4 team game metagames in that the positioning of the individual players doesn't matter as much. Like, we can have something like... What's going on right now is that Slam has a blacksmith in a market, so he's probably going to, like, boom up, go for a fast castle, and, and, and just go huge on his economy, because he doesn't have a barracks. If you have a barracks, it means you're making military at some point this year, and... Well, Reed is uh, going for, you know, scouts in the pocket, which is generally unheard of on something like, a, like Arabia, but... Since the map is just so easy to wall, like, in this case, even though Slam is adjacent to Tammy, Slam is, like, almost the pocket here. Because really, the reason that, you know, you see the pockets are the ones who go for the greedier strategies like the Fast Castle Age is because they're further away from the enemy team and it's much easier for them to have more, they have more time to react and more time to defend. It's a lot harder to get rushed when you're further away from the enemy team. And while Slam might be technically the flank and that he's adjacent to Tammy, his map is so easy to defend that he might as well be the pocket and he's just playing as if he is the pocket. Not only that, he's the Persians. That's the other thing to keep in mind here. 
So there's two factors going into this. One is map is super duper easy to wall, and the other factor is, well, he's Persians, and the Persians, their town centers work faster, and that allows them to get a huge boom, and their tech tree is really, really good. Like, knights are just the go-to unit in, in, you know, most team games and when it comes to Castle Age Warfare because they're just so much stronger than everything that the Feudal Age offers. And not only that, not only that, they're also super-duper uh, mobile. Like, they might not be the fastest unit in the game, but they're way more mobile than, like, if you were going for crossbowmen or something like that from the pocket. It'll take forever for those crossbows to get there, whereas the knights will be able to get there in time. Uh, it looks like fire is just routing Tsunami here, focus firing down the individual units as Tsunami. Not able to pull back in time, is going to lose a couple spearmen for free. He's going to be super, super duper careful here, and he's going to need some help as, well, the scouts from Riot were also there to assist him, and... One thing that's interesting as well is it looks like Rats has neglected to close off this back area. Let's see if he is actually aware that there is a little gap here. Yeah, it looks like he's, he's aware of this, yes. And, uh, well, look who's, uh, look who's closing in. He's got this wall off over here. I guess he assumed that Tsunami would have that thing covered, but nope, doesn't look like it. As Riot's in here with the scouts, and that's gonna, that's gonna be very, very bad for Rats. As, see, Rats with the market, and... Well, it looks like he's been tributing Tammy quite heavily, quite, quite heavily. If we take a look at Tammy's perspective here, expect to see some tribute coming in. I'm assuming it's Tammy that's being slung here, mostly because Tammy's score is so very high. I know, though, that Riot is not being slung, despite keeping his score up with Tammy, so that's very impressive. Attempted quick wall here from Rats is not going to be quick enough at all, and this villager is going to go down. This is going to be super bad. The last thing you want to do when you're slinging is, well, get raided. <laughs> That's why the people who sling usually do wall up, and while he's, you know, working on the wall up, uh, I don't think he realized that, well, Fire and Riot were able to just squeeze their way in on this, and so many villagers down, gold mine being denied here, and that means he's not going to be able to tribute as much resources as he wants, but Tammy looking for revenge, gonna go send out some knights, and see if Tammy can go do anything about this. I love this gate here from Vex. This is a quick wall with style. <laughs> He's looking for something wide enough and cheap enough that he could put to protect his castle. Now, of course, back to Mayans, and, you know, since he's in the pocket position, uh, he's gonna go for plumed archers. They always do. Because you can't just go for eagle warriors, usually. Uh, most of the time, eagle warriors are not quite as strong as knights, and the Mesoamerican civs don't have access to knights at all, and, well, plumed archers are just a great, great, unique unit. The Mayans are just super suited for this strategy because their eco is just so strong that they can get out the castle relatively easily, and their unique unit, the Plumed Archer, creates very quickly, costs almost nothing, and it just has very, very good stats. So, it's also quite mobile, and mobility is very important from the pocket, so you can go assist your flanks, who will probably be doing that Russian shenanigans. Looks like Rats is, well, in a very, very poor position as he has zoned off all of his gold entirely, and kind of a similar story from Tsunami. There we go, Rats slinging Tammy a little bit there. Similar story for Tsunami, as he's got no gold of any description. Fire has lamed this with a couple of houses to prevent Tsunami from saturating that gold, and there is really no gold that is easy for Tsunami to harvest from, and, well, Tsunami's going to try and wall this area off and see where things go from there. And the thing with Tammy right now is Tammy's looking kind of scary with the uh, added sling from the resources, but if we take a look at the population, well, there's an important thing to keep in mind. So... Tammy is ahead in terms of villagers over Riot, but Riot's still relatively equal in military pop. In fact, Tyrant is just ahead in general, as Bact has some units, but Kyo does none at all. Rats going for the sling, slam booming up, and really Tammy doesn't have a substantial enough military or eco lead right now, I think, to warrant the sling. Rats isn't really in this game. Right now, POZ is relying on the fact that Tammy is gonna be huge and going to try and overwhelm their opponents with a tech advantage. The thing is, is with the sling, is that you take one of your own teammates out of the game, but you snowball another one of your teammates, hopefully to make up for that. Looks like Tammy's going to actually worm, uh, worm his way in there and do a lot of damage to this economy. So the thing here, yeah, is that you, you, it's mostly the tech advantage that makes the sling so powerful. You get all your upgrades first and, you know, start booming up, get out a bunch of extra TCs, and hopefully that advantage is enough, get to the Imperial Age sooner than everybody else, enough to snowball a game. Fire still with the lead over Tsunami right about now, but Tsunami still holding out with a pretty solid wall off. Still no reliable access to gold, he does have to go all the way back to go mine this gold. And, well, Rats did get delayed a lot in his sling, so it wasn't as effective as it normally would have been. Riot's got these scouts stationed here just in case, and... 
Oh, the Knight's not able to quite get in yet, as Slam gonna put up a couple of buildings to go block that off, and Tammy's gonna have to do something with all this money, and Tammy's not gonna sit around waiting all game, of course, but he's gonna go move his Knights in and try and see if a doubt is, uh, sorry, a Riot, <laughs> if Riot is able to get pressured. Uh, but it looks like they're all walled up. He's looking very, very good for Tyrant right now, but POZ still in this game. Still in this game as Tsunami was able to hold out and survive here. Not dead yet. Rat's still getting the sling off, but, you know, he's, he's getting all uppity again, trying to build a house, and Riot's not having any of this. Gotta keep him in line, man. Can't let Rats have what he wants. The house does get to go up, actually. <laughs> Don't think Riot meant to do that, but this villager... He's not coming home tonight, unfortunately. He's down for the count, and that's all she wrote. This little wall off here is going to deny Tammy yet again, and this sling not paying off right now for POZ. Poison of Zone not really able to take advantage of the sling. Tammy is huge right now, has a lot of units, a lot of knights, a lot of villagers, and Tammy can't do anything with the knights quite yet. And these scouts being an absolute nuisance, they might actually clean up all of Tsunami's gold miners. He's just having a rough game. See if you can get the quick wall off. Oh, wow. Really uh, fast reaction speed from Tsunami. He's going to get the quick wall off, except this one villager, whoa, huffing way too much paint, decides to walk out of the walls. And, well, no, I'd say that's successful uh, scout harassment that wastes some wood on the palisades. This villager has no idea what she's doing, where she is, or who she is. And the rest of these villagers all clumped up. <laughs> and then they're not mining at all until now, so it gets a lot of idle time. They might as well be dead in that case. The interesting thing here, of course, is that Tammy's had enough of this shit and is going to put down a castle, a siege workshop, and huff and puff and blow down Slam's walls. Because Slam has been super duper greedy playing farming simulator inside of his walls this entire game. Dude's got no military and it's booming on the flank. He does not give a fuck. However, he's going to have to start carrying as the battery ram is coming out here, and I'd really like to see a uh, siege workshop for some mangonels to go deal with these rams. It's nice to see though that Slam does have some monks, he'll be able to convert those knights, but that's probably not going to be enough. And the pressure is on Tsunami right now, as Tsunami is quite a bit weaker than Fire. Mangonel coming out, I love this decision from Fire, he's being super duper aggressive, building this far forward with a very BMTC. <laughs> this gold is my gold now, says Fire. And with the Manganel, he'll be able to start tearing through these buildings a lot faster. I love the Manganel response from Tsunami. Nice, he's going to get a couple couple good shots off on fire before he gets a chance to react. Ooh! See, the Manganel is the great equalizer. When you're behind, I love to see Manganels here when you're at a military deficit, because they can trade so efficiently, since the Manganels do attack in an area of effect. By the time you make one Manganel, uh, it's, you'll be able to make that much quicker than uh, by competing with your opponent on fair terms. Like, if he's got 50 crossmen and you've got 5, don't try to make crossmen. You will lose that straight up fight because you're outnumbered. Make a Manganel, try and outplay him, try and out micro him, and trade efficiently. You should be able to trade a Manganel for, you know, upwards of maybe 10 to 20 crossmen if you're really, really good with the micro and your opponent makes a mistake. These buildings are not going to last very long, but Tsunami's still holding out with some good Manganel control. Is going to be able to keep fire off of things, but. This table's gonna go down eventually as uh, Tsunami's not gonna be able to kill that Manganel from that distance. That Manganel is, fur is, uh, is far enough away. Camel's coming out here from Riot. Good choice again to deal with the Knights. Plumed Archer's coming out here from back. Bunch of villagers. Keo looks like he wants to do some forward building, but he's gonna get caught by Tyrant as they are patrolling in that area. Keo's town center does get denied, and that's really, really awkward for him as Tyrant, just on top of things, gonna deny Keo his own expansion, who is trying to boom up as well, a la Slam. And <laughs> Slam is taking the classic Black Forest player approach, and he has decided to build like maybe 30, 40 billion layers of walls here to try and install Tammy as long as possible. Tammy's opted for petards, and this is the one situation in which petards are actually a legitimate unit and not giant uh, heaps of garbage. In this case, you're not actually burning the food and gold. These guys are actually very good at dealing with clumps of walls with no defense on the other side, and Slam is doing, of course, the wise decision, and he's got this... A siege workshop here in case he needs to make a mangonel to deal with some rams that'll be pressuring this. Really, right now, the game is heavily in favor of POZ at the bottom half of the map, but in the top half of the map, things are looking real bad. Real bad. I hope this sling from rats is paying off because Tsunami needs help, like, right now on 18 different levels. Now, Tammy, because Tammy's being slung super hard, is up to the Imperial Age first. Followed by Keo, who has also been super duper greedy this game, and that's going to matter a lot. Those two, first the Imperial Age, and that tech advantage is huge from Castle to Imperial. Not quite as big as Feudal to Castle Age, but still massive. Cavalier upgrade coming out from Tammy, and this is really bad for Rita. This is villagers caught in the wrong neighborhood. 
He thinks it's his neighborhood, but actually, this is Tammy's town now. As Tammy's building a castle, gonna start pressuring this. Uh, Reed's doing the correct response here, building a castle of his own, also on a hill, which is great. And a defensive castle, just like with when you're uh, getting tower rushed, you always want to put down your own defensive towers in response, defensive castle in response to offensive castle. We'll try and be able to hold this line. Bunch of houses going down. Reed's actually looking to be in a little bad spot. What I like is that Tammy does not waste his time here. Tammy sees that the, that Slam has enough walls to stall anybody for you know several games of AoE2 even. So Tammy's decided, screw it, I'm going to huff and I'm going to puff and I'm going to blow down Reed's walls. Then I'm going to send my own knights into your base, Slam. So, However, that doesn't quite work as Slam, the master of quick walling, is going to make great use of every single building and resource he has at his disposal. Great teamwork here from Tyrant as he's putting down another castle, trying to restrict the mobility. A fantastic quick wall off here from Ria. These knights going nowhere. Going to have to tank that castle fire, tank some TC fire, and Tyrant looking like they might be able to stall this out. But this castle is going to get tread down because, again, tech advantage. Get battering ram, and there's not enough military for Tyrant to really hold this line. Good news is though, Tsunami realizes that this situation is looking very, very bad, and another thing that's great is one I like to call the Panic Castle. Build a defensive castle if things are looking really bad. It's a great way to stall for time and just kind of survive. And really, all Tsunami has to do is not die. The winning move is not to play in this case. He just has to not lose and he'll win, because Tammy is doing work on this side. Kyo is also huge. Cavaliers coming out, very, very important, powerful unit as they have enough pierce armor that they're able to just tank town centers, castles, and other ranged unit fire. They're just super powerful, but very expensive units, and once you get the eco for them, it really, it really does some work, and this mango is going to get focus fire down, so really, really good play here from Keo. Trebuchet is going to do a lot of pressure, and really the, being the aggressor in this case when it comes to castle v. castle fighting it is super duper important, because... Look at all the stone that Riot has to waste trying to repair his castle from Tammy. Good focus fire from Slam, gonna get a tread, but yeah, all this stone going to waste, and, well, Tammy's just gonna be able to keep pressuring them and not have any stone at all, because these uh, these trebuchets have to focus fire down the trebuchets and not the castle. So, this favors Tammy. Tammy looking massive here with a huge score lead, and Keo actually out-booming Slam, but Slam did get pressured, so the sling finally paying off from POZ. That might have been the right move, and, uh, I love this little village that uh, Rats has going on, but they still have a big problem here in that Fire still has a slight lead over Tsunami, but right now this is still kind of a cripple fight up here as both of these players have not been able to build up much of an economy at all. They're both very, very weak, but actually Tsunami does have a, a, slight, a slight pop lead, so actually on second thought it looks like it's shifting a little bit towards uh, Tsunami. And you know what? I'm going to assume that that's because... Tsunami has actually been slung a little bit by Rats. In fact, I think that Rats has also been slinging Kyo as well. I think that's why the, the everybody on POZ is, is slowly moving ahead, and that's why Tsunami's not dead yet. These two castles are going to be really, really hard to deal with, as Fire is not really going to be able to clear those out until he gets to the Imperial Age and is able to build trebuchets. No real safe way to deal with that. Huge trebuchet fight here. <laughs> we got World War I going on with the Trench Warfare with just nothing, nothing but trebuchets and castles. Oh god, both teams struggling to make any progress whatsoever, but Riot blowing so much stone trying to repair these. They need to kill these trebuchets, but they just can't. Slam here patrolling doesn't know what to do. He's waiting for the trebuchets to move up. These trebuchets have to be dealt with, and Slam knows he doesn't have enough guys to be able to charge that line, because the Chukunus are there to back it up. And things are looking pretty good for POZ, but Slam's got a lot of guys now, too, and so does Bact. Oh, this is super close, but I love Tammy's unit choices here. They're great. They're great. Chuko Nu is very, very good against units with good pierce armor, like the Cavalier and the Plutoned Archer, because they fire so many shots. There are archers that are much better against standard archer counters. However, Riot here has decided, fuck it, I'm not focusing your trebuchets, man. I'm going straight for your castle, and he gets Tammy's castle, which is massive. Now, now POC has to fight underneath two castles from Tyrant, and they have no castle to fall back to, so Slam will be able to charge this a little bit more. Keo is fed up with this nonsense and is going to start uh, charging those trebuchets from uh, Rhea. But yeah, this isn't actually their base. They don't have the home field advantage, so Tammy isn't going to be able to replace this, this castle that easy. Sling coming down really, really hard, and yeah, I love the choice of camels as well to go deal with the Cavaliers. As the game drags on, AoE 2 does tend to boil down to a game of counters, so you can trade efficiently with your opponents. Back tier has decided that he thinks, and this is an interesting decision as always when it comes to AV2, where do you send your troops as a pocket? 
Generally, if you think that wherever the enemy team is pressuring, if, if you think the rest of your team can hold the line without you, then it's much better to go attack the enemy directly than go defend uh, where you're not needed. And in this case, Bact has utmost confidence in the rest of his team. He thinks that he thinks that Slam and Riot can hold this line, and I think that's very reasonable considering that, well, if we look at populations here, I mean, Rats is like no military units, right, because he's been slinging the entire game. So this is actually just a 2v2. So assuming his teammates don't die, and Bact manages to keep Keel busy, which he, he's doing a good job of doing right now, uh, Tammy will actually be 2v1'd on this side, and, well, that's going to be really, really bad for Tammy, as Tammy's going to be losing ground at a remarkable rate, so great response here from Tyrant. They realize now that it, it's reaching this point in the game where the sling is starting to lose effectiveness, it sort of peaks around, you know, 20 to 30 minutes, and once the game goes beyond 40 minutes, it starts to become less effective, because Rats has no dudes. Without any dudes, you can't win. <laughs> then, without any dudes, you can't win. Words of wisdom, guys, because, well, players are starting to get closer and closer to the max population of the game, and Rats's military population is zero means that his teammates are going to start getting outnumbered here. You'll be able to, you know, have, like, double the military units of your opponent if you're being slung sometimes at a point, but when everybody's all capped out, having all those extra resources... I mean, look at Tammy! Tammy has over 4,000 wood floating around. Tammy literally can't spend this money fast enough because the sling is running out of steam. And we saw this in the previous uh, War is Coming series that I, I casted that you guys might remember. The uh, NC and Friends in Arma versus Tyrant Legends. A very similar thing happened where we see the sling running out of steam. Poison of Zone falling heavily behind here. And they I think that Rats like needs to tr start transitioning to actual dudes. And... Well, he's recognized that he needs dudes, so he's building a blacksmith now, but a 50-minute castle age isn't quite going to cut it here, I think. Things are looking quite bad. Kyo, though, uh, does realize, though, that Tsunami uh, is in need of a little bit of help, and Tsunami's been doing really, really well on, on, on his side, so major credit there. Uh, but now, Kyo is going to be over here and just going to clear out all of Fire's guys, and what this means is that Tsunami has so many trebuchets that Tsunami will be able to clear out all these castles. And Fire's in deep, deep, deep trouble. But the thing is, is that Kyo is nothing at his own base. He doesn't have enough stuff at his own base to be able to defend this, and since he's making light cavalry now, I'm assuming that Kyo is running out of cash a little bit here. He wants to mine this gold mine, but he can't saturate it because Bact has decided to go for him. And again, I love that decision from Tyrant uh, to send Bact to go attack the enemy pocket to go attack Kyo. It's very, very smart, because he knows that, from a population standpoint, Riot and Slam should be able to hold this against Tammy. And by keeping Keo off of those two guys, then basically Tyrant wins because there's just no military units here from Rats. They What they had to do is they had to turn that advantage that they had from uh, Tammy being huge and having a massive, massive you know tech advantage. Tammy and Keo w were really, really powerful at a point. And they had a huge tech advantage, a huge military and eco advantage, but they had to actually do something and win the game. And Slam here with the 15 billion layers of walls and some great teamwork, well... These guys managed to actually hold the line. These two defensive castles here make a huge difference as well because they were on a hill. They have an elevation advantage uh, over Tammy's castle on the low ground and Tammy's units on the low ground. Those guys here camping the tiny bit of elevation, and that means that their castle takes less damage, deals more damage, and Tyrant turning this game around. I think that they basically clinched this game, actually, as Rats here not able to transition into anything else fast enough, and the sling not quite working. I guess it just goes to show, guys, that you can't, can't quite sling uh, against Tyrant. Uh, sometimes it, 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 can, it can be really tricky. Now, while Fire might be very, very much so dead, uh, it doesn't really, doesn't really even out, though, unfortunately, for POZ. They put up a really good fight, and it looked like they were actually going to take Tyrant down for quite some time. They just weren't able to get in enough damage and actually breach those lines. This decision here from back to go to Kyo basically uh, sealed the game, and the fact that you know, these two defensive castles here, Slam and Riot, working really, really well together, and Fire able to snowball his side in the early game uh, was really, really good. Tsunami still managed to hold the line. Rats did a lot of work with his slinging, but at a point, it just kind of, you know, peters out. And this gold mine is no longer property of Kyo. It is now belongs to Bact, and Bact is going to move in here with his uh, plume archers. Very, very hard to deal with. I wonder if uh, we'll start to see some mangonels from Kyo in response to this as... You know, having a lot of horses, it looks like they're just going to call it GG. I was going to say, you know, if, if you have enough archers, you can actually kind of gun down the paladins uh, and the hussars, you know, to a degree. So it's usually a good idea to back up. When your opponent has, like, mass ranged units like Longbowmen, it's a good idea to back up your melee units, like your, your cavalry that's going to charge at them, with some mangonels. That way your opponent is damned if they do, damned if they don't. They can't focus down the onagers without being charged by the cavalry, and they can't focus down the cavalry without getting blown up by the onagers. 
So I'm assuming that's something that he was considering, uh, but it looks like the Siege Rams were the first order of business here. I mean, really, not too much uh, POZ could have done at a point, mostly because of their decision to have rats go for the heavy sling. The population just wasn't there for them. It didn't. Uh, it, they weren't able to really snowball the lead. Tyrant able to defend extremely well, wall off everything, and this map was, I think, closed enough. Judging by the land, it was, like, closed enough that... Well, the sling didn't work so well here. It really didn't. Really, the only person who was, like, vulnerable was, like, kind of fire, and fire definitely got punished a lot in, in the later stages of the game, especially because the, the Mongols tend to drop off at this point when they, like, hit the... when they hit the Imperial Age. Because they need like all these super expensive technologies, and you want to transition to Mangadai because they're so hard to counter because they're cavalry archers with attack bonus versus siege weapons, which traditionally counter cavalry archers. Things like onagers don't work as well anymore. Uh, so yeah, cavalry archers, the Mangadai, very very powerful, but they require a lot of resources and upgrades. And you know you want siege weapons as well from the Mongols. You want all sorts of fancy technologies that cost way too much, like onager and uh, siege engineers. So uh, the Mongols do kind of like dip a little bit in the early Imperial Age, and then they resume having an incredibly strong uh, late game, you know, and early uh, mid, but like, there's this early Imperial Age that's not super good there, and that has allowed a Tsunami and Fire to sort of reach like a little bit of a stalemate uh, for a while, and yeah. Good job on Tsunami for being able to hold the line. POZ looked really promising, it really, really did. This fight over here was epic, but it wasn't quite enough as Back decided that you know, fighting in the stalemate was just not advantageous to them. He needed to divert Kyo's attention, and, well, it worked, so... Yeah. GG well played for both POZ and Tyrant Warlords. Amazing, amazing, solid game of Land Nomad from both teams. Wow. Alright, guys, let's go check out the achievements, as that is the end of that match. What a good, good game. Unfortunately for POZ, along with the sad music, there goes their dreams of slinging Tammy into a massive juggernaut. Hey, look at the military population. I mean, that kind of tells the story here, as Tammy and, and Keo maybe had like a combined army of 100, whereas Bact actually outnumbered both of them combined without really being slung. Uh, you can see that you know, Fire versus Tsunami is basically as even as it gets. A little bit weak in the early game, but Tsunami manages to you know show us how to defend extremely efficiently, and these guys are basically as even as possible, but backed with an army, like, an absolutely massive army here. The outnumbers the two people being heavily slung, so that's very substantial. Riot and Slam as well, able to, you know, keep keep even with the military, and the fact that Rats had nothing matters a lot. He also lost four villagers uh, due to Riot's scouts, and that also slowed down the sling a little bit. If you look at the tribute sent and received. Uh, Tammy just wasn't able to spend all that money towards the end. Having a lot of military production facilities, like even more, might have been necessary in that case, but even then, that just goes to show the sling can drop off as Tammy just not able to spend all this money. It's so much money. So much money. Rats sent 15k to his team. Slam is doing a little bit of uh, tributing as well uh, to fire, you know, to kind of deal with the fact that Tsunami was also being slung. Gotta keep it fair, guys. But yeah, really, uh, the sling, you know, 15k resources matters a lot, but they just weren't really able to take that lead in the early game and just absolutely just crush Tyrant. They were just not quite able to seal the deal here. And, yeah, that's uh, that's how slinging drops off a little bit, guys. I, You know what I liked is I liked that in, in Game 4 between uh, Tyrant Legends and NC and Friends in Arma that when they had uh, some slinging going on that... It was like Cab doing a little bit of slinging as the Vikings. They had him go to the Castle Age first, and they also had to make uh, some galleys before the sling, uh, you know, really started coming out. So even though it didn't snowball Tyrant as much during that game, they allowed uh, they allowed Cab to have a potential to build military units if they needed him to. He had the ability to defend himself. Uh, so it was like slower early game sling, but the fact that he got to the Castle Age, he was still able to transition into military when they needed him. I like things like that. The sling here can definitely really, really work, but just in this case, the map was too closed off, and Tyrant was able to react very, very efficiently to that. Slinging can definitely work, but the game must be closed out uh, before a certain point. So yeah, it was a very interesting game. We can see differences in play styles here and how they shape the outcome of the game. So yeah, GG well played. Uh, Poison of Zone and Tyrant Warlord. It's a great game. I really enjoyed watching it. And I hope you guys enjoyed watching it too. If you enjoyed watching this video, please do leave me a like rating as well as perhaps take the time to check the rest of the stuff on my YouTube channel. 
plenty of other Age of Empires 2 videos, including other expert game commentaries. I also have videos of other games, too, so if you like this one, you'll probably like those as well. As always, guys, I really do appreciate the support, as always. Pleasure to have you all. The positive response to my uh, expert game commentaries has been phenomenal, and I look forward to bringing you guys quality content in the future. So yeah, uh, the War is Coming tournament has been a lot of fun to watch, and there's plenty more games where that came from, whether War is Coming or just miscellaneous expert games. So yeah, guys, thank you as always for your continued, uh, for your continued support and for watching, and I'll see you all next time. GG, well played!